Hi, this is Mark. Congratulations. You have found this amazingly awesome show. Chances are you're listening to it right now on whether it's iTunes or Stitcher Radio or some other mobile app that allows you to stream this amazingly awesome show to your ear holes. And I can't stress how awesomely amazing the show really is. But did you know that you can also catch the latest episode of this show on the Tangibound Network? That's right. Go check out TangiboundNetwork.com. You can look them up and you can listen to it right there. It's even mobile friendly. What more could you ask for? Which means you can pull it up on your iPhone or your Android, even your Windows phone. Yeah, who has one of those? But still, point remains, you can do it. You can do it. Check it out. TangiboundNetwork.com. Listen to this show, the latest episode, every time. Check it out. To the last drop Are you gonna blow your head off Take good aim and don't forget to duck A light sucks every Monday And all the way to Sunday But I wouldn't have it any other way I don't care how you're doing What's up or how's it hanging I'd like to buy this world Last drink and Life sucks all of the time Stick it up your sunshine And then you'll see the clouds every day And then you'll see the clouds every day And then you'll see the clouds Welcome to the Spooky Spectacular Crazy Life Halloween episode. Nah, just kidding. We're, we are going to be talking about some stuff for the holiday, but uh, nothing super spooky or spectacular. Well, I won't underplay ourselves. We can be spectacular. Mm -hmm. Anywho, I digress. This is Jen, uh, the hostess with the mostess of the podcast. And with me tonight is Brian. Hey, Brian. Hey. And Hanno, unfortunately, our third partner in crime is uh, not able to join us today. So it'll just be the two of us. But uh, we will definitely put on the best show we absolutely possibly can. So. That being said, how has your week been, Brian? Um, up, up and down. It's, uh, it's, it, we're, you know, I've still been kind of fighting, you know, funk that's been going on mm -hmm. for a while here. Um, but part of that was probably because, you know, again, I ran out of my antidepressant and I was dealing with trying to get more of that. And, uh, I think I finally got it sorted out though. Um, I think I, I finally got it to where my insurance covered it. Good. So I was actually able to get a prescription for it as well as my, my doctor still also was like, here's some samples just in case. <laughs> um, <laughs> but so either way I should be covered on that. And, uh, that was, that was a, a tremendous win, you know, because yes. it, it stinks when I have to call because of the way the messaging system is at, at my doctor's office. She doesn't always, and it's not, you know, it's not her fault. It's the way that it's done there. It's just, she doesn't always get my messages. And as a result, it can take me a while to get through to get what I need, you know. And when I first started calling, I still had some. By the time I got it, I had been off of it for a week, you know. Mm. So, again, I've got to go through the the initial thing of you know, it balancing everything back out. And it's not as bad each time because each time, you know, there's not a big gap, but yeah. it, it's still enough that when I do take it, I feel a little off for a few days, you know, mm -hmm. uh, until it, everything kind of gets straightened back out. So, you know, last couple of days, it's been a little eh overall, but it caused me to, it was a big part of the reason why, uh, the week before, my friends went to a beer fest, which I, you know, I like to go to sometimes, but they're really tough because of the crowds for me. 
Sure. You know, because there are a lot. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of people. And they're all, and it's not like, you know, if you go to a sporting event, there's thousands of people. But really the only time that you feel that there's thousands of people is when you're leaving. Mm -hmm. Because usually as you're going in, the crowd's kind of moving pretty well. But on the way out, it just seems like it's just, you know, one big jam. Um, But at these beer fests, people are just everywhere, you know. And there's big open areas and stuff in them, too, because they're on big fairgrounds and such. But um, it can get really overwhelming. And a couple of days before they were going to go, I... Was and I'm low on money too, so that didn't help, you know. So I was kind of like, well, you know what? I, I'm really mentally not feeling like dealing with crowds, and I don't really have the money. It seems like the universe is kind of telling me maybe to skip this one, you know, mm-hmm. as much as I didn't want to, because you know I, I like hanging out with the with my friends and stuff, and it's they're always fun, but well, mm-hmm. mo- for the most part, <laughs> right? So um, I I I got a hold of a you know, a couple of them and said, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm out for this one. And, you know, luckily, like I, hopefully that they were able to move the ticket because it was sold out on Saturday. So I'm sure there's people wanting the tickets, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but it, you know, it just kind of stinks when your mental health pulls you out of something that you really like to do, but it was something that was, it was a self-preservation move. Because I know yeah. if I would have went, and Tony ended up telling me that it felt, he said it to him, it felt, uh, busier or m- more full than normal too. So if that's the case, you know, if he felt it and he doesn't have these issues, there's a good chance I would have really kind of felt overwhelmed dealing with it and not having mm-hmm. my medicine to help me regulate that, you know, so that's, yeah. that's a recipe for no good, <laughs> you know. But like I said, you know, I got the medicine, you know, again, I've been taking that for a few days here, which is good. And, um, you know, it, w- him and I went out last night and had, you know, a few drinks and it was, you know, it was a good time. It was a weird night at the bar, but it was a good time overall. So, you know, and I went to a thing with my sister for my sister's birthday, mm-hmm. but I found myself sitting there constantly kind of staring off at into the like night sky breathing like really mm-hmm. focusing on my breathing. And so my, you know, my anxiety was running pretty, pretty high last night. And I don't really know why I didn't really have a reason. It just was, you know, so that's why I said yeah. it's been kind of, kind of up and down this week. So overall good, but mm-hmm. you know, like not, not bad, but it's just, it's, I've kind of been all over the place. So how about you? Um, yeah, things have been good. Things have been good. Um, before we actually move on, I just wanted to make a point. You make sure that you recognize the fact that you, through the entire week, it sounds like you've recognized limitations. Mm -hmm. You adequately assessed your mental state and what you needed and you acted upon it, even if it wasn't the popular decision, you made the best decisions for you. Mm-hmm. And when in a situation where it's high stress and high anxiety, the first thing that you found yourself doing automatically was sitting outside and breathing and yeah. going through your motions. Right. So I think you had a pretty darn successful week. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it is. Um, yeah. But when you're I mean, in it, no, it's positive. Yeah. When you're yeah. in it, it isn't. When you look right. back, it is. Yeah. There's. Right. Yeah. So it's not, it's not that either of us was wrong. It's just, yeah, it's very yeah, much. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that you, you yeah. got that because yeah. sometimes when we're in it, like you said, sometimes when we're in it, we don't see these things. Mm-hmm. So I just want to make sure that you, you recognize that and give yourself some credit for that. Right. Um, and then I also, I want to do a, a quick shout out to a good friend of mine who this last week, um, well, she's been battling with, I, I have, I have to struggle a little bit with the words here because she's not been diagnosed. Hmm. So I don't want to necessarily, you know, I'm not diagnosing her by any stretch, Yeah. but she has been, um, dealing with high amounts of emotions Mm -hmm. and low tolerance for, um, situations and not wanting to do social interactions and stuff because of the stress and the, um, amount of 
frustration and emotion attached to stuff. So, you know, sounds pretty much for a you know for someone who's not in the in the medical field. To me, it sounds like she's hand, she's experiencing some um, some anxiety and some stress issues. Yeah, potentially based upon what she's told me, sounds like there might be even a little bit more in depth going on up there. But so she's been doing this for about six months now, and I keep encouraging her to go seek professional help and just to talk to a professional. I said, you know, yeah. all I can tell you, I can't tell you what it is. Cause I don't know. I'm not a professional. All I can tell you is my experiences and what I've been through and what you're going through seems to mirror it pretty closely. Yeah. Like the stuff you're telling me really kind of matches up to the stuff that I started with on my mental health journey yeah so i would recommend you going and talking to a professional and seeing what they said so finally after six months of trying to handle it on her own and not getting much better and really struggling she finally owned the fact that she could not handle this on her own and she needed help and asked for it and that does not does not make you a weak person if you can't handle it yourself it's just there's some things in life Picture if somebody wanted you to lift up five, six, seven hundred pounds. Could you mm-hmm. do it yourself? There's not very many people who could, you know, so exactly. it doesn't hurt to ask someone else to help you lift the other end of it or whatever. It's, it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's not a sign of a weakness. It's, it's a sign that you're willing to do what's best for you, you know? Yes. And it's a sign of strength in my, yeah. import, my, my book because yeah. Owning the fact that you can't handle everything on your own yeah. and opening yourself up and being vulnerable to someone else and yes. saying, I need your help and asking for help is a huge step in trust. And it's a huge, especially when you don't know the person. Yes, exactly. To which that was part of the problem. She doesn't have a good, she, up to this point, she doesn't have a good general practitioner or um, a good um, medical support system yeah. in her in her area which certainly up. makes a difference yeah it's... yes so she's starting from scratch basically mm. so but i wanted to shout out to do a shout out to her about how proud i am that she was able to take that step and, and how empowering it is to see her um go on this journey and of self discovery um she's gotten involved in some meditation which she's never done before that's good she's yeah. gotten involved in so it's not just medicinal that she's looking for right she's really taking a lot of steps she's got a workbook that she's working on for mental health just taking a lot of steps to work on herself and get herself in a better healthier place so good kudos to you i'm so excited for her yeah as it is it, it it's a big step and and it's it it's a lot of work, you know, you like, you don't, Mm -hmm. it seems so silly to do stuff like workbooks or different stuff, but it, it really helps people, you know, I, Mm -hmm. like I said, you know, like me, I've got two sheets or three sheets, whatever it is, the distorted thinking worksheet that I look Mm -hmm. at a lot, or I reference it in my head a bunch Mm -hmm. because it's, it's the most, but, it's the most profound thing that I've got out of therapy. You know, like it really was when she handed that to me and I looked at it and read it, it really made me start reframing and it helped so much for Mm -hmm. how to recognize and what to recognize, you know, as distorted thinking. So I could go, Oh, well normally I would have dismissed this and now I'm going, no, that's the problem is now I have Mm -hmm. to, you know, so it, it, it allow it forces me to, recognize and then work on what I need help with. And and it changes your overall scope as you slowly mold those outer edges, you know? Yeah. So, I good. have an injury to my ankle from way back when, and uh, my muscles in my ankle don't speak very well to my brain is the way the doctor prescribed it to me. And he said, it's a lot like when you're learning how to play your instrument or a piano or guitar and you see your hands and you know what shape you want your hands to make <laughs> yeah. and what keys you want your hands to hit. 
but you can't seem to make it happen. He's like, that's what a lot of, that's what's happening with your ankle and your brain. And I equate that to a lot of the stuff that I work on is I have to retrain my brain. I have to train my brain to start recognizing and actually doing things differently. Mm -hmm. And it's so incredibly difficult. And something that I mentioned to, to my friend and she said also resonated very deeply with her is the fact that nothing is, uh, there is no worse feeling when you feel like you can't trust your own head. Yeah. That's it, like it the is. worst feeling in the world. Right. When you cannot trust yep. the information that your brain is feeding you. Yeah. Because your brain is proven to be untrustworthy. Well, what does everybody, you know, you always tell people, you know, ah, go with your gut. You know, what, what's yes. your gut tell you? It's like, well, mine's lying to me all yes. the time. My brain is lying to me so much because over the years it's it's changed all this stuff so it's like you said it is really difficult and that's why having like those worksheets is important because mm -hmm. then you can look at things and go wait a minute i'm being lied to here and then you can take that step back and go mm -hmm. here's the actual truth you know because then you can remove some of those biases from your brain off of things mm -hmm. you know and go this isn't that bad you know, and yes, <laughs> and it'll allow you to actually move forward in life rather than being frozen. You know, mm -hmm. exactly. There's a great, um, a great cartoon out right now that actually reminds me of a TV show from I want to say the '90s called Herman's Head. Uh huh. Um, oh, the there's a Inside Out. Is that hmm? the, is? Are you thinking of Inside Out the movie? Yes. Yeah. Which Herman's Head is the is a sitcom from I believe the early nineties. Yeah. Inside yeah, Out 90s. is a cartoon for the last five years or so. Mm -hmm. I think it's only like a year or two old, somewhere like that. It's a few years old, yeah. It's not yeah. very old. Yep. Not too old. But both of them deal with there's different characters inside your brain mm -hmm. that are responsible for different things. And I just I can picture one of those characters in my brain is the one that lies to me. And when I call it out on its stuff, it was like, what? Yeah. I, what? That, that's how I was seeing it. Sorry. What, what, what do you want me to do? Yeah. You know? And basically I have to constantly call it out and go, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, yep. it's like, you are not telling me the truth. Whoa. <laughs> it's like, no, no. So, but she's getting better and she's really, um, taking steps along the, on the path of recovery, which, Good. You know, recovery from what? I have no idea and I can't diagnose. And I told her that from the beginning that Absolutely. I'm not going to diagnose you. Right. Just recovery from having a not so pleasant well, life that she's been living to a good life that she wants to have. Well, it's like my, my therapist told me, like when she gave me the distorted thinking worksheets, she even mm -hmm. pointed out, she said, what you're going to notice is that almost everyone does a lot of things off of this list. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that that person has mental illness. It just means that, like I said, sometimes it's a product of your environment. You know, if you're around somebody who's negative all the time, you start becoming negative. It doesn't right. mean that you have depression. You just may become negative because you're around negativity. This is how kind of how, you know, you'll see sometimes generation to generation, you'll see, you know, negative thinking just passed forward. And mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, so it could just be that. And there, you know, I'm sure there are people out there who just, there's just some people who don't want to be negative anymore, but mm -hmm. they, that's, that's the, you know, the only thing that they've really got against them. Like they don't seem to really have any other mental illness. They just can't stop looking at the negative side of things because work has trained them to, or somebody they're with has kind of be mm -hmm. beaten that into them or, you know, whatever it is over time. And by mm -hmm. beaten into them, I don't mean physically. I just mean, you know, just the rep yeah. repetition of, of it. So, exactly. And, and it's so true. Like after reading those and then paying attention to when people talk, you really start going, that person's really negative. That person's really negative. And it's, you start going, wow. And then, you know, because at times like with me, I was like, wow, I sounded like that. I did that, you know, and that's, mm -hmm. I always tried to bring it back to me. I wasn't trying to like judge or label anybody. It's just like, you start seeing it in other people and you go, wow, that's someone who I took advice from, 
But now I'm listening to them going, wow, they, it was just because they gave me similar advice to what I wanted, you know, like yeah, kind of a gave thing. me what I wanted to hear. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it can be very eye opening in, in a, a few different ways. So mm-hmm. I'm just, I'm glad she's reaching out for, or reached out though. That's good. Yeah, it is. It's, it's real positive and I'm, I'm real happy for her right. and stuff. And, uh, yeah, and, and I'm doing really good. Um, I'm still kind of battling with the, the mania a bit. Um, I'm working alternative shifts. I'm doing, um, some night work right now. So normally I'm a day shift girl, but I've been doing a few nights here, there working the midnight shifts Mm -hmm. and it's been, um, I think messing with me somewhat, you know, it's just anytime you switch your schedule around and stuff, it messes with you. But my sleep schedule has been all wacky and I've not been doing the best I can trying to keep some normalcy there. So I've got some work I got to get done there, but I'm, um, I'm handling things pretty well. I'm trying not to, um, dissociate, disassociate from things. I'm starting to kind of pull away and, um, and not actively participate in stuff. Yeah. So I, I need to make a, I've noticed that and I'm starting to make a real cognitive effort to like, no, I've got to be in this moment. I have so much other stuff going around me. There's like lots of stuff going on in my head. I've got lots of things happening. Um, we're in the process of buying a house. You know, I'm still finishing up some wedding stuff, you know, like thank you notes and things like that. Mm-hmm. I've got some stuff at work. I have all this stuff going on in my head and I'm disassociating from the moment that I'm in and I need to kind of refocus and say, no, this is the moment I'm in. This is, I need to feel these feelings. I need to own where I'm at with this. And then, um, I can process and move on from the other, with the other stuff when the time comes to deal with that. Stuff. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. So I'm still, I've got some definite, some work, um, that, that I've been working on this week. So I've been doing pretty well with all of that. Um, it's interesting at work. There's an opportunity for me to, um, to interview for another position. And I went through the first interview, the, like the, the phone screening type of a thing. Mm -hmm. So I went through the phone screening and, and again, this is the same company that I've been working for. So it's, I'm not changing companies or anything, but, um, I went through that aspect of it. And I was anxious and I, I did really well, but you know, they, it's always called passion. I'm very passionate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which means overexcited. Yeah. Is, you know, so it's, you know, it is what it is. I think it's, it's a product of my personality, but it's also a product of the, you know, of the anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, but what are you going to do? It is what it is. And, I have to accept it and I have to own it because it's part of me. Yeah. So, um, but we'll see how this ends up going, whether I can make it to the next, um, phase, which would be actual in-person interviews. And, uh, I'm okay with it either way, going either way. Yeah. You know, I've, I've processed it. I've thought about it. I've processed it. I've done the worst case scenarios I've done. All of that stuff, and I've gotten to a good place that regardless of what they tell me, whether I do or do not get an, in, an actual in-person interview on it, yeah, um, I'm okay with it. Well, that's I good. Think... That'll always help too, you know? Yes. Because you you're not putting all your – essentially, you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. Like, well, if this doesn't happen, then whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not all or nothing scenario. Exactly. And I already have things set up that – because one of the um, criteria is some experience that I don't have. And if I, I, I feel I wouldn't apply for it if I didn't believe that I was the best person for this job. Yeah. And I'm owning that fact. I'm, you know, I'm not saying that I am. I'm mm. saying I believe that I am. Right. You know, and... If it makes me seem con- conceited or whatever, I don't care. This is my fact. This is what I'm, I'm, this is my, 
what I, I own and in, in my knowledge, in my competence, this is what it is. Yeah. And I've really come to terms with that and said, no, I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm not going to sugarcoat it or hide it, whatever. I believe I'm the best person for this job. That is why I applied for this job. And if they don't give me this job, then what am I going to do to get, you know, what am I missing to get to that point? Right. If they come back and say, well, you need more experience, then my rebuttal back to them is, okay, how can I get that experience needed yeah. while still working here? Yeah. As Heno's pointed out, you know, plenty of times on here, it's mm-hmm. when you run into something like that, it becomes a, you know, how, how is this an opportunity for self-improvement? You know, and if you exactly. go into it, looking at it that way, that even if you get turned down, it's, it's not a personal thing generally, you know, don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. There are sometimes people get turned down at work for personal reasons, you know, but yeah. most of the time, I guess it's probably not that it's probably that there is just a better candidate or whatever, mm-hmm. but you know, so, so if that's the case, like you said, if they say, well, you need more experience, but okay, well, how can I get this experience and how can mm-hmm. I improve myself so that next time I'm the candidate instead right. of being the second choice or whatever? Yeah. So it's a good way so, yeah, of going So in. that's going, that's been going on and I've been doing really well with, mm-hmm. with processing through that and, and trying to manage that and stuff. And I really feel I've been doing some work at work, um, at work. Some work at work with social interactions because mm. I think I've been coming across to some people um, and not necessarily negative, but maybe rubbing some people the wrong way. So I've been doing some work at not reading into anything, yeah, taking them at face value because and reminding myself continuously that. I have no idea what's going on in their head. I am not a mind reader. Yep. If they are upset about something and it involves me, it is their responsibility to bring it to me. It is yep. not my responsibility to keep checking with everyone to make sure they're okay. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like it is their responsibility to bring it to me if they have a problem. Right. Yeah. Because if you say, you know, like, are you okay? And someone says, I'm fine. You don't go, you know, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Because eventually exactly. they'll, you know, it'll be like, are you mad? No. Are you sure yeah. you're not mad? No. And you know, eventually, yeah, yeah, they will be mad. Exactly. So, yeah. Are you mad at me? Yeah. No. 12 you know? hours later, are you sure you're not? Like, ah! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> now I am. <laughs> like, so, will it, will yeah. it shut you up? Then yes, I'm mad at you. <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah. So it's, <laughs> Just a lot of little stuff like that, but like I said, it's just it's been a lot of a work week. It's been a lot of working, a lot of me working on things and and processing things and and uh, and going through my emotions and my in my uh, my classwork, basically, yeah. for lack of a better word, and making my making sure I do all of my exercises, yeah, and all that good jazz. That's good. So, yeah. Yes. But something that um, that I wanted to talk about today is a great article that I read the other day on fear with the upcoming holiday. And, uh, yes, this is what makes it the spooky, spooktacular, mm-hmm. um, crazy life. So we're going to talk about fear and coping with fear, handling fear, and all that wonderful jazz that comes along with that ugly four-letter F word. Which is not the one you're thinking. Well, maybe it is if you're thinking yeah. fear. Yeah. Anyways, um, 10 ways to fight your fears. Whatever it is that scares you, here are 10 ways to help you cope with your day to day fears and anxieties. These tips are for people who are coping with everyday fears. If you've been diagnosed with anxiety related conditions, see our page on generalized anxiety disorder. Will do. Thank you. Um, this is actually an article. From NHS.UK, um, it is under the stress, anxiety, and depression section. But I really liked this article because it was very generalized. So I feel it's applicable for people with mental health issues as well as people who do not have mental health issues. I, for one, have always been, for lack of a better word, a scaredy cat. Yeah. Yeah. I can be afraid of my own shadow at times. Um, part of it is that goes along with the mental disorder. 
and my anxieties and whatnot. Um, and part of it is just, I'm not a, I don't like haunted houses. I don't like being scared. You know, I think we've covered it on the show before. I don't scream. I eat. Yeah. <laughs> I squeak. I make funny noises. Yep. People find it entertaining to scare me because I make funny noises. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't know why I do it. I'm assuming it has something to do with the fact that I don't want to be loud and scream because I have a hard time being loud, but then I'm loud when I talk. I I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Anyways, it all boils down to the fact that I eep and squeak. Right. Not very good for scaring somebody off. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I used to love uh, scary movies, and I, I always was more that I preferred more of the ones that were like the psychological type ones. You know, Uh, the ones that Mm. really get in your head and to Mm -hmm. where, you know, like I, I don't like the the slasher or gore type ones. I've always, I've watched a lot of them, but it was more the ones that like, you know, if you're sitting home by yourself and you hear a noise and you're just like, did I shut all the windows? Is the door locked? Is it, you know, like you're running through that checklist. Like, uh, you know, you think someone's trying to get in kind of a thing. Like I like the movies that really mess with you more like that. Um, But since I've been on antidepressants, I have to watch those kind of things because I have more lucid dreams than I ever did before. And now if I watch some of these movies, if they get in my head enough, they will go into my dreams also. And to the point that I can't get them out of my dream, like I'll feel like I can't escape. And Mm. um, and it'll wake me up and it, it really freaks me out. So... I have to be a little more careful of stuff like that now than I used to. So, yeah. And that's where I've always been. Yeah. And I'm also very empathetic. Right. And so I empathize with characters very easily. So especially if it's a very well-written movie, like a lot of the psychological thrillers are. The slasher movies, not so much. But the <laughs> psychological thrillers do have some good caric- caricaturing and stuff and great strong characters. I can be am very empathetic to them and pretty soon <laughs> I'm, you know, freaked out and all that other good jazz. So back to our article. The first thing it says, so when you're getting freaked out and you have your fears, you need to take a time out. It is impossible to think clearly when you're flooded with fear or anxiety. First thing to do is take a time out so you can physically calm down. Distract yourself from the worry for 15 minutes by walking around the block, making a cup of tea, or having a bath. Pretty good suggestion. Yeah. Um, Distract yourself. You know? Yes. It makes sense. Like, if you're feeling anxious and, you know, whatnot. Mm -hmm. Because anxiety and fear do, you know, heavily overlap, so. I would definitely, I recommend puzzles. Um, I use puzzles a lot and with the smartphones, you can use, you know, any of the puzzle games. Candy Crush is a great one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, that, that's a real popular one that I use. Right. I also do right now Sims build it is it's like Sim city build it. It's a, a basically a, a building simulator, like a city building simulator, but it's enough of a puzzle to really distract my brain. Uh, I have to be careful. I don't get obsessed with it, but right. I, you know, that, so that's like kind that of my thing. Distract. Yeah. That's why I, I always do stuff that's more, uh, simple, I guess it, it doesn't mm-hmm. feel as much like a video game. Like, you know, I, I do Sudoku on my iPad. Perfect. Yeah. You know, because even if I do five or 10 of them, it's like, I don't, I'm not going to get like, uh, just one more level or, uh, just one more, you know, like if I'll play, mm-hmm. I, I don't play Candy Crush so much. I play, God, what's the name of it? This is a Marvel, it's basically Puzzle Quest, but it's with Marvel characters, you know, where you match I colored see. things and whatever. It's, it, you know, but I'll be like, oh, if I do, you know, if I keep going, I'll level up this or whatever. So it's like mm-hmm. with the Sudoku, it's just, this is it. When the puzzle's done, the puzzle's done, you know, like there's no, yeah. I don't have that, like, Oh, I gotta keep going to level up, or I gotta keep whatever. It's just like, nope, I've, you know, I, I'm mm-hmm. just, I'm just playing to relax, essentially. Yeah. 
Because I know me, otherwise I'll be up all night trying to level up, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I've been there before. Yeah. I've uh, I've been very obsessed with the Sims build it game right. last it's week or so. Easy enough to do. Very yeah. obsessed. Right. Yes. So um the number two, what they recommend is breathe through the panic. Huh. Breathing. Yeah. Go figure. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, reoccurrence every single show. You gotta keep breathing. Yep. So if you start to get a fast heartbeat or sweating palms, the best thing is not to fight it. Stay where you are. Simply feel the panic without trying to distract yourself. Yep. Place the palm of your hand on your stomach and breathe slowly and deeply. The goal is to help the mind get used to coping with panic, which takes the fear away. Mm. So. This is a really good tip because a lot of people, what you want to do is when they run up against something that causes them great anxiety or fear – is they want to leave. And by le- mm-hmm. by leaving you never you never push yourself to show yourself that you're capable of something, you know? And um and there's sometimes don't get me wrong, there's sometimes that that's the right answer is just to leave. But yes. if you can stay breathe through something and then finish what you're doing, in the end of it you'll be able to look back and go, you know, I faced it it wasn't as bad as I thought it was and I can make it through it. I just, I, maybe I can't do something as quickly as someone else may, because I have to take mm-hmm. a minute and focus on my breathing, but I still made it through, you know? Exactly. And number one and number two may seem counterintuitive, mm. but it's more along the lines of number two comes first. Then you take the time out. Yeah. So breathe through the panic. Um, put your hand on your stomach is a great Great technique because mm-hmm. if you put your pan on their stomach and breathe slowly and deeply, you can feel your know, your chest cavity and your diaphragm opening and cl- uh, opening up yeah. and closing down, and it'll help slow you down and it'll help calm you down. Right, because it also helps you focus. Yes, back to something basic. You know, it's 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 and why you- um uh, what do you call it? Like the therapy, like grounding. It's basically a form of grounding, <laughs> almost. You know. Because you're like, I can feel my stomach. Focus on the muscles moving. Focus on, you know, really kind of dial it down and keep dialing it down to, you know, picture your stomach moving in and out and then picture or, or you know, your lungs pressing mm-hmm. open and close. You know, you do that kind of stuff and just, you know, like I said, by the end of it, you'll realize that you're focusing on the breathing and everything else and you're not focusing on the fear and anxiety anymore. Exactly. Yeah. So breathe through it. And then it gets to the point where you can't breathe through it anymore. That's when you get to take the time out. Yeah. But, you know, so really try to stay in the moment if you can. Right. And just process it and keep working through it because you're going to get, you're going to be better off the longer you can stay in the, in the, yeah. in the fear spot. As right. long as you're safe. Yeah. Let's put that big caveat out there. Of course. Yeah. Yes, as yep. long as it's, it's a safe place for you to be. You're just, you're afraid, but you have fears and anxieties, but you're not in any legitimate danger. Mm-hmm. So if you're in legitimate danger, flee, 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 flee. Yeah, Get that, help. that's a whole different story. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. That is not what we're talking about. Right. <laughs> All right. Number three, face your fears. Avoiding fears only makes them scarier. Whatever you feel, if you face it, it should start to fade. If you panic one day getting into a lift, for example, it's best to get back into a lift the next day. So this is in the UK, so they're saying lift, but they mean elevator. Although, it, I mean, you could totally use it here too, as a lift is a like a you know a ride service. I mean, if if mm-hmm. you're terrified getting into a car, get into yes. a car. You know, I mean, like literally, that's the best way to get over it is to get into a car and start with go somewhere close, then go somewhere a little further each time. Or it's same with mm-hmm. from what I understand with driving. I still haven't been able to do these techniques, but um, or I haven't been able to use them successfully, I'll say, but they, they tell you if you have a fear of driving to get behind the wheel of the car, drive. If you start panicking, pull over, breathe through it. And then basically once you feel okay, get back on the road, go another sm- short distance. Don't turn around and go right back home. You know, just try to push mm-hmm. yourself a little further each time. And eventually 
your body should just go, hey, I've done this enough times, and then it's, you know, it's old hat at that point. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's retraining. Retrain the brain, folks. You know, there's two different types of fears. There's rational and irrational fears. And both of them can be handled in the exact same way. The rational fears, though, you just have to make sure that you... I understand the safety aspect yeah, of exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Always but, always yeah. be safe if you can, yeah. Yes, if you're the not safety safe, aspect then, of it. Yeah, if you're not safe, then go, you know, get to safety. But, yes. But like you said, the key there is being able to recognize the difference in the two, you know. Yes, and that's and that's a, a big skill that needs to be learned. Yeah. It's not a skill that you just – most people are born with. We have to learn them. And it's really funny because a lot of our fears end up coming from – those that surrounded us when we were growing up. Yeah, that too. Yeah, yep, the root of our fears have a tendency to come from them. Things that they were afraid of, that translated to us, and now we're afraid of. Mm. Now, that would be irrational fears because right. it's nothing for us to be afraid of. It's something they were afraid of yeah, exactly. that we've just inherited. Yep. So give that baggage back and – yeah. Take a, take control and recognize the fact that if it's a rational fear, yes, handle that differently. If it's an irrational fear, then you can handle it this way. Technically, you can handle both of them this way. But yeah. anyways, you get where I'm saying, folks. So face your fears. Ah, here's one for you. Imagine the worst. Yep. Imagining, try imagining the worst thing that can happen. Perhaps it's panicking and having a heart attack. Then try to think yourself into having a heart attack. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, it says it's just not possible. The fear one away will run away the more you chase it. Yeah. This goes back to, remember I mentioned that, uh, my mm-hmm. therapist, when I was talking with her and she was like, okay, let's say that happens, then what? And she would keep walking me through, like, to where I'd walk is I'd walk into, like, ridiculous territory with my fears. To mm-hmm. where at some point your brain starts going, this is stupid, you know? And, and yeah. then you start going, and then it's basically like, yeah, exactly. It's like, that's why, don't let your brain roll down this path because, you know, there's no point. Just, okay, well, what's the, you know, like I said, you know, when we were in Chicago, you know, the... What's the worst thing that could happen to me that day at the Picasso exhibit? There's tons of people. It's hot and blah, blah, blah. I went in there and guess what? It was exactly what I thought it would be, you know? And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, no, oh, no. But, it, you know, I, I, you know, stayed close to Heno. We walked through it. Uh, we took our time. We didn't let others' pace dictate our pace. You know, we we just basically at a certain point, you, you it got to where no one else existed in that room except for when I was talking with Heno. And the art, and the art, you know? So I took, you know, it took a worst case scenario. I actually lived it, embraced it. And then at the end was like, do you realize what I just did? You know, kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And now that's my, I can do certain, I can do this, you know? And it it really can change the way you start looking at other stuff. Because now if I'm, there's going to be something super crowded, I might still go, Hey, I, I dealt with a really crowded area. I was okay. You know, mm-hmm. I know I have tools to get me through that, you know, so it's very, very important to push yourself at times. And again, you know, knowing that you're safe, knowing that you're not going to be in harm's way. Obviously, if you start having, you know, uh, a panic attack or something that's a little more physical, you know, again, you know, get yourself safe. But you do have to sometimes just push yourself through some some stuff. It, you know, exactly. Because the worst case scenario a lot of times ends up just being a, an extreme, you know, mm-hmm. and, and you can't don't live your life for extremes, you know. No. And the next one, which is really very apropos, is look at the evidence. It sometimes helps to challenge fearful thoughts. For example, if you're scared of getting trapped in an elevator and suffocating, ask yourself if you've ever heard of this happening to someone else. Yeah. Ask yourself, what would you say to a friend who had a similar fear? Mm-hmm. I've done this many times to myself. And I'm like, okay, if if somebody came to me and said this to me, what would I say to them? Yeah. yeah. And if that answer doesn't match what I'm saying to myself, then there's a problem. And then 
and I have to start working on that. Yeah, definitely. Yep. Mm-hmm. Because either I'm lying to them or I'm lying to myself. So yep. one of the two needs to change. So that one, that's a good one. Number six is tr- don't try to be perfect. Uh, this is a big one for many people. Yep. Life is full of stresses, yet many of us feel that our lives must be perfect. Bad days and setbacks will always happen. And it's important to remember that life is messy. Life will life you. <laughs> it is proven time and time and time again. Yep. <clears throat> It's like shoots and ladders. Sometimes you're on a, on the way down and you get the shoot. Sometimes you get the ladder. Yeah. It's it's true. We talked like we did a whole episode on perfection and striving for perfection. So uh mm-hmm. you know, if you want to go back and listen to that episode cuz it's it's got a lot of good points about perfection and striving for perfection in life is distorted thinking and it tends to lead to you putting way too much pressure on yourself, um, overlooking good options in the meantime, because they're not perfect options, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and honestly it'll lead to a more miserable mindset because if it's, you know, when you generally strive for perfection, it's usually perfection or nothing, you know? Yep. So you end up missing out on a lot of great opportunities. Ever torque a gear too hard? Basically, if you tighten down a gear and you tighten it too tight and you make it perfectly tight, the gear no longer moves and it's stagnant. Yeah. If you tighten it just enough so that it's everything can move smoothly and stuff like that, it's not perfectly tight. It's just tight enough and everything moves smoothly and you get to move forward. So it's just, there you go, gearheads. I did a mechanical <laughs> metaphor. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Visualize a happy place. Mm-hmm. Take a moment to close your eyes and imagine a place of safety and calm. Could be a picture of you walking on a beautiful beach or snuggling up a bed with the cat next to you or a happy moment from ch- childhood. Let the positive feelings soothe you until you feel more relaxed. Well, there you go. Pretty reasonable. Yeah. Talk about it. Sharing fears takes away a lot of their scariness. Yep. If you can't talk to a partner, friend, or family member, call helplines such as Samaritans. Opens. Uh, they gave a number, but it's a uni- yeah, United Kingdom a number, United so United. we're not going to with that. Um, but call a helpline, call a family member, partner, a friend, somebody in your support group. If your fears aren't going away, you can ask your general practitioner for help. General practitioners can refer people for counseling, psychotherapy, or help through an online mental health service. So, you know, enlist your support group. If the fears aren't going away. Yep. For sure. And this was, um, this was part of my thing because, uh, you know, I've gotten to a point that fear was completely dictating what I did and didn't do. And that was part of the reason that I wanted to seek help. So, yes. you know, like that says, it's, you know, talking with other people is great because a lot of times they will – basically other people will point out that you're being irrational or, or that you're, you know, kind of point out to you that this isn't a – air quote, normal thought process. Yes. If you find yourself getting told that a lot, seek some sort of counseling, you know, go talk to your doctor about this. And because like they said, even if it's, you end up in a, maybe it's not with a doctor, but maybe it's a support group or something like that. Just talking your fears out, like it, that said, it, it can take the air out of those balloons so much. Cause yes, like I said, I, I, you know, I was sitting there before Chicago and I was telling my therapist about how I was afraid of this, this, and this. And we walked through so much of it. And by the time we were done, I was kind of like looking back going, wow, that's, you know, not mm-hmm. that big of a deal. I can face this. I can do this, you know, so it can Sometimes really Sometimes you need to hear it. You just, you need to hear it out loud. You need to hear yourself say it. And then you're, once you've said it and you put it out there. All of a sudden, all the emotions around it fade away. Yeah. Well, and sometimes you just need someone else to go, well, if that happens, I'll be here for you. You know? Yes. Um, and yes. I'll, I'll help you through that. Or, or even if it's just an, it'll be okay. 
You know, sometimes those mm-hmm. things are incredibly strong tools. Other times they feel patronizing, but you know, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but they are, they're very strong tools. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, go back to basics. Lots of people turn to alcohol or drugs to self-treat anxiety, but this will only make matters worse. Simple, everyday things like a good night's sleep, a wholesome meal, and a walk are often the best cures for anxiety. Mm. Yeah. Keep your patterns. Like, we are creatures of pattern. We like to have, you know, go to bed at a certain time every night, get up at a certain time every day. You know, do this, do that. We like having these routines. They're comforting. They make you feel better. Do not be afraid of just breaking it down, going back to the basics. Make sure you're eating good food, nourishing your body so that your body can nourish your mind. And get your exercise, get those endorphins going, Mm. and sleep. Let your body repair itself at night. Right. So... Just basics. We all know how to do them. We were all trained them when we were kids. Just got to keep applying that. Yeah. And number 10, my favorite, we've bored yourself. (laughs) Give yourself a treat. When you've made that call you've been dreading, for example, reinforce your success by treating yourself to a massage a country walk, a meal out, a book, a DVD, whatever little gift makes you happy. Yeah. I will say, try not to tie it to food. Well, really, you could say that about other stuff, too. Like, if you have an yes. issue with buying, you know, like shopping uh, away sadness yeah. or, you know, so if you have, if you know you have some sort of a, uh, an addiction or a, an emotional attachment to something, maybe, mm-hmm. avo- maybe avoid those things, you know? Yeah. But yeah, it just, I mean, try to, try to be responsible with the reward. Mm-hmm. You don't want to go overboard. Yeah. But claim that, you yeah. know, we can't, we've talked about wins on here. Yeah. Claim those wins. Yep. Plant that flag. Let everybody know, shout from the mountaintop, say, I did this and I'm proud of it. Yeah. Doesn't matter if other people do it every single day. Yeah. Doesn't and matter. You don't. I'll, I'll tell you this too. And again, it's, it, you know, it's it just me advocating, you know, counseling again. But it's, if you, there are times where I put off making phone calls for a week, two weeks, a month, whatever. Mm-hmm. And when I do, most people, if I tell them that I did that, they're just going to look at you funny, you know? Um, but right. when I was in therapy, there was at one point where I'd put off a phone call for over three weeks and I went in the next week to therapy and I told her, I was like, Hey, I, I finally made that phone call mm-hmm. and you know, she basically celebrated the win with me, you know? So yeah. there is that element too. And, and, you know, but it also, as you explain to other people, how important it is for, or how difficult it is for you to do something like make a phone call or Mm -hmm. establish this or that, you know, they, they, a lot of times people will kind of celebrate with you, you know, like they'll, all right, Mm -hmm. you know, great, you know, because, you know, you don't need the, it's about time talk, you know, right. you need the, all right, you know, again, it's like I've talked before on here, how some days just getting up, putting on different clothes is a victory. That's your victory Mm -hmm. for the day. You know, most people are not going to celebrate that with you, you know, so Look for the people who will. Yes. Those are the people that are important in your life. And those are the people who care about you. And like I said, if you can't, if you don't have people that are like that, talk to your doctor, seek out counseling or a support group or whatever, you know, because there are other people out there that will celebrate with you, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you just got to pay them. Yeah. Well, hey, whatever. (laughs) Whatever works, right? (laughs) I joke. I joke. People... Honestly, I truly believe that people in the medical field, um, especially in the mental health field, um, don't get nearly their due, yeah. you know, yeah. for all of the hard work and stuff that they do. Right. But yeah, sometimes you do. You got to, you know, toss a few shekels, some, she- uh, shekels over to somebody. Yeah. And say, well, hey, you need to listen to me for a little bit. Well, that's the thing. I mean, they they know because they've been trained to know how hard it is for people to do certain things, you know. Exactly. So when exactly. you say, hey, I've been putting this off for three weeks, but I finally – I was able to do it. 
it's mm-hmm. it's no different than if you were in physical therapy and you couldn't uh, run at full speed, let's say. And then yeah. finally you're like, hey, you know what? I ran from one end of the street to the other today. And people around you will be like, all right, great. You're back to, you know. So, exactly. Same idea. It's the good stuff. Yep. Absolutely. Well, with that, <laughs> that's the end of our article. So do you have anything else you want to wrap up with the uh, article with? Not with the article. I do have one other thing I wanted to bring up that I thought was kind of cool, but um, All right. I, I talked. Well, we can move past the article. And what else is going on? Okay, I, I talked a while ago about how uh, Facebook had put something into place that if you see someone posting uh, something that you think, like if you see someone post something and you think that they're in a bad mental state, like you know, if they posted something like you know. Uh, don't think I can take this anymore, feeling really down or, or feeling, you know, in a bad way mm-hmm. or something. You could report the post essentially. And then when, it, um, for reasons, one of the reasons would be that like you think the person's going to cause themselves harm and mm-hmm. Facebook would like alert police in the area to go check on the, the person or whatever. And I thought that was a really cool addition because there are people who it, it may save lives. You know? Yes. And it looks like Instagram, which I believe Instagram is owned by Facebook, so it makes sense that they do this. But it looks like Instagram now has this too. So if you see someone post something on Instagram that seems like they may hurt themselves or be a harm or in a really bad position, or maybe it shows them actually hurting themselves, Mm -hmm. um, you can do the same thing, I believe, which is report it, and then one of the options will be... You know, and this, and it's anonymous. It doesn't tell them that you did it. It's an anonymous process. Um, and I just thought that it's really cool that, um, uh, that these social media sites are doing that because people reach out a lot of times on these social media sites because they can post something that's kind of anonymous, but not anonymous, you know? Like they can yes. put a cry for help out there. And mm-hmm. this is a way for people to actually help you know, uh, rather than just click the like button or type, Oh, Mm -hmm. hang in there or whatever, you know, like this is a way to actually do something to maybe help them, especially if they're in a really dark place, you know? Now, and don't be afraid of reporting someone and it turning out to not be a true situation. Yeah. Again, I would, I wouldn't do it unless you really think that they're in a bad position, but if you think that they're in a bad position and you're questioning yourself whether to do it or don't do it, do it. Contact, you know, right. report them because you'd rather be wrong on the right side yeah. of things. You know, well, if you thought about it and didn't do it and something happened, you'd feel so much worse than if you reported it and it turned out it was a false alarm. Yes. Also, if they are posting things like that on there and it is a false alarm, they need to get help with that. Yeah, I was going to say that. Because that, that is hard. not yep. appropriate. Well, uh, what happens is when you report this, the person gets a thing that says, um, someone saw one of your posts and thinks you might be going through a difficult time. If you need support, we'd like to help. And then there's a, a menu of things that says, like, I'm worried about someone after seeing content they've shared about suicide or self-injury. What can I do? Uh, I'm having thoughts about suicide or self-injury. I need to find a suicide hotline for myself or a friend. How do I help law enforcement who has posted suicidal, uh, how do I help a law enforcement officer who has posted suicidal content? How do I help a member of the U.S. military community who has shared suicidal content? Or mm. how do I help an LGBT person who has shared suicidal content on Instagram? You know, so that'll pop up. You can click on the thing and then it'll help, you know, it kind of helps point toward, um, uh, how to help, uh, for the person. So Mm -hmm. it's just, it's a great idea. I'm very glad that they have, um, that they've got this stuff in place. And I, I like the fact that, like I said, Facebook and Instagram have both done it. I think. I don't know if Twitter has anything like this or not, but, uh, you know, if they don't, it wouldn't shock me if they do at some point, you know, um, of the three, Facebook and Twitter should be the first ones to do it. But, you know, Instagram, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm glad it's there no matter what. So 
Um, Absolutely. I'll ha- I'm actually I'll, I'll put a link to the article about this in the show notes if anyone wants to look at it. Um, so it'll be there. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that was what I had. Awesome. Well, then with that, I think it's time for us to draw to a close. Um, if you'd like to continue the conversation with me, um, you can always reach out to me at Jen's Crazy Life on uh, Twitter. You can also um, reach out to all of us at the Crazy Life Podcast at Outlook.com for emails. You can also reach us on our website at the Crazy Life Podcast dot Weebly dot com. And do you, Brian, how can they reach you? Uh, well, first of all, they can also reach Heno on Twitter at Ida Heno, uh, or on, awesome, good call, or on Facebook at Heno Heiter H E I T U R. Um, you can see when new episodes of the show post on Twitter at uh, I lost the link. Where'd it go? There it is. The Crazy Life Pod on Twitter. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Stunami. Uh, the other podcast that I'm part of, which is Salty Language, can be found at Salty underscore Language or at SaltyLanguage.com. Um, the show's Facebook group is Facebook.com slash group slash Crazy Life Podcast. Um, also on that page, we have links to different uh, chat lines, suicide prevention number, uh, hotline numbers, um, places to help uh, that can help put people in contact with therapists. Um, so, you know, it's on the show there's like a notes page or something like that on there. Um, if you look and you can't find it, contact one of us and we can, you know, get the information to you. Um, let's see. Uh, what else am I forgetting? Oh, we're part of the Tangent Bound Network, which can be found at tangentboundnetwork.com. Um, <clears throat> boy, I'm having trouble tonight. <laughs> um <laughs> You know, it, it, one quick thing too. I have a blog that I've posted, and I haven't put a new one up in a while. But if you haven't read it and you'd like to, it's at stunami.wordpress.com. And I posted some articles on there, like about how entering into a relationship with somebody who has mental illness is basically a, you know, a three-way relationship. And yes. you know, and I've posted some other blogs about you know stuff I've dealt with mental health wise. Um, so if you'd like to read that and I really need to put something new up there. I haven't posted anything in a long mm-hmm. time. Um, if you, however it is you find us, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, whatever the, the program or app or whatever, if it has a like or a share option, please use that because that helps, um, uh, it'll help keep us relevant. It'll help other people find us quicker. Um, uh, because we'll be, mm-hmm. you know, the more likes and stuff we get and, you know, and, and also like on iTunes, if you can leave a, a review for us, you know, the, the more and better reviews we get, um, we can end up in the search options, uh, like for the top ones. So people may see us, you know, more. And, uh, yeah, I think that's all of that. So then I'll remind you that we're not doctors, therapists, trained professionals of any kind, just a couple of people sharing our experiences and some stuff we found that hopefully can help you. If you feel you need help, you know, like Jen said earlier in the show, please don't self-diagnose. Go talk to your doctor or a doctor and, and you know, uh, get a course of action that way. Um, and, of course, as we kind of just covered, if you're feeling suicidal or you're planning a suicide, again, it doesn't have to be that you're at the point of doing it. If you're in the planning stages, any part of the process, honestly, but, you know, um, please seek out help, whether it's your support group, a doctor, call 911, tell them you're having a mental health emergency, uh, just go to the hospital, um, you know, or like I said, we've got some links for, uh, where you can just talk to people online or on your phone, uh, at the Mm -hmm. show site. So check out one of those first, but please don't act on those thoughts. Um, there's help out there if you want it. Absolutely. And it just, it's so imperative to make sure you keep yourself healthy mentally, physically. Um, this world is crazy and is ups and downs and all this other craziness, but you need to be part of it. We want you to be part of it. So please, if you're really, if you're thinking about doing anything negative, 
get help. Reach out and get help. Yeah. And until next time, keep breathing, everybody. And don't forget to wiggle those toes.